Hi, I'm Janet Ward, and I'm here to talk to you today about the mother of exiles, the Statue of Liberty, and the legacy of the Holocaust. In 1883, Emma Lazarus wrote a poem dedicated to the Statue of Liberty as a tool for its fundraising while it was still being planned and constructed. That's where the phrase mother of exiles comes from. Some of you will be familiar with that. I would say that this poem, this sonnet, that has become so closely associated with the Statue of Liberty is at the core of our country's identity. But it wasn't always so, and today let's explore how that came to be. A biographer of Emma Lazarus has noted this subversive power that the poem has, and how in times like ours, the poem is becoming a tool of our times, both to be attacked and defended. And I think it gets to the heart of the matter. Who do we let live among us? To whom do we grant asylum? Who do we ban and push back into exile? And what do we do to safeguard and shore up our democracy's ability to recognize the humanity and the dignity of the dispossessed, of the tempest-tossed? I would suggest that the Statue of Liberty is an icon toward which we can aspire with that goal in mind. Now, Emma Lazarus was a fifth-generation, upper-class New York a uh, Sephardic Jew, working with Ashkenazi Jewish immigrants freshly arrived from the Russian pogroms. She was an activist in her own life, so the poem was putting into words what she herself embodied and did every day. This summer, I was a tourist at the new museum on Liberty Island, dedicated to the original torch of the Statue of Liberty. It opened in May of 2019. There I was with thousands of visitors from all over the world celebrating, in a way, the hope that the Statue of Liberty embodies for us. These two pictures, for me, represent the hope and the horror of visiting monuments and memorials. And this dichotomy is something I wish to highlight, but also today I wish to show how these two pictures, so apparently disconnected, do have something in common. The one on the right was taken in May of 2014 at Sobibor. Sobibor is one of the final solution death camps, purpose-built death camps by the Nazis to extinguish the Jews of Europe during the Second World War. The rainstorms had come shortly before my arrival, and the archaeological digs had been underway in various plots, rectangular plots across the crematoria killing fields where bodies were uh, cremated after the gassing. To my horror, I realized as I was walking that there were bones around me, washed up to the surface because of the rainstorms and because of the removal of the topsoil by the archaeological work going on. What I think was in this picture before me was a segment of a child's arm. I could not reconcile this experience of what happens to the dispossessed, to the exiled, to the banned, when they are pushed into a place where they can no longer return living from, with the hope that the Statue of Liberty recognizes, gives us, and that we recognize so continually. And I wanted to explore that further with you today. Now, the Statue of Liberty, um, especially the torch, is the beacon, um, I find particularly compelling, but so did the fundraisers. Um, Frédéric Auguste Bartholdi, the French sculptor who put the thing together with the assistance of Gustave Eiffel, yes, the man who constructed the Eiffel Tower, the first thing he did was build the uh, beacon and the arm and also the head. Uh, the head toured France for fundraising purposes, and the torch came to a world exposition in uh, Philadelphia in 1876 to help raise funds here, like um, Emily Lazarus's sonnet did. 
And then it went all the way back to Paris to be assembled with the statue itself. That picture on the left is from 1883 in Paris. The Statue was completed in 1886, it's unveiling, in New York. It was intended to mark the centennial of American independence. It was called the Statue of Liberty, Enlightening the World. But the problem was that very soon it became apparent that the world, the beacon that it was holding up, was to be a white world coming in from Europe. Uh, the immigrants coming in that were welcomed were from Europe. The most that you could hope for was an aspirational uh, white Anglo-Saxon status uh, as an Irishman or as an Italian, as a Russian. It was not therefore giving an image of liberty for all and the masses from everywhere rather than a, it was a, a limited version of what we would consider to be its current day version of welcome, of refuge. And even worse, it began to be associated with a form of white nationalism. It became known as a symbol that whites would recognize as a restrictive measure uh, rather than an inclusive measure. Turning now to the mid-1980s. In 1984, the torch, which was in a bad way uh, in terms of its uh, restoration uh, needs, was lowered and in fact replaced with a brand new one as part of a series of restoration work on the statue in 1986. So this is a picture on the left of the old torch that I went to see in May this year that now has its own special museum dedicated to its um, message. That's that coming down there on the left. On the right, in 1985, a Holocaust survivor called Nathan Rappaport, the sculptor of the Warsaw Ghetto Fighters Memorial in Warsaw, designed this statue called Liberation, and you can immediately recognize this is a US liberator liberating, saving, bringing to life somebody who is close to death, a Holocaust survivor. And the symbolism is important because it's less than a mile away from both the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island. It's in uh, Liberty State Park in New Jersey. It gazes literally upon um, the uh, Statue of Liberty. It was intended as a triad of saying, showcasing what America was meant to be, namely the liberator of the victims of the Holocaust, but also a source of refuge um, and safety for refugees. The sheer body size difference between liberator and victim gives you that message. How nice a triad of hope and responsibility this would be for American history. If only American immigration history had been remotely like this. In 1939, in February, 20,000 Americans convened upon Madison Square Garden in New York for what was essentially a pro-Nazi rally. The uh, German-American Bund was in charge, as you can see. People gave the Nazi salute. People sang our national anthem. And here's my point that ties it back into the Statue of Liberty. While the Statue of Liberty was being modified to suit a whites-only immigration uh, preference among uh, those uh, voters, so too was George Washington, a founding father, co-opted in the service of American-grown fascism. One Jewish protester rushed the stage and he was immediately pounced upon and beaten. At the rally, they even said that George Washington was America's first fascist, and I quote, that was really said. This was our America, if you could fill even the Madison Square Garden with 20,000 uh, people that easily in February of 1939. Perhaps what I'm about to now tell you comes as less of a surprise if you've never heard of this particular incident that is quite infamous in US immigration history in terms of what we do when we are faced with refugees and exiles with real need. 
This is the story then of the SS St. Louis, a ship bound for Cuba from Hamburg in May of 1939. They had paid their way, these Jewish families, 900 Jews were on board, 400 of them were women and children. They paid their way, they were relatively well to do, they'd spent everything they had left on getting the visas for Cuba and getting the tickets for this passage. They knew they'd never see Germany again, or at least they hoped so. This is 1939, this is just after Kristallnacht of November 1938. So, they reach Cuba and they're unfortunately turned away, they're not allowed to dock. The German captain, who is apparently a, a decent man, who removed the portrait of Hitler uh, from the uh, ship's main room during Shabbat services, tried desperately to safeguard the interests of his uh, passengers. People got frantic, Jewish relief agencies tried to work with Cuba, it didn't work. Then they turned to the United States, again, it still didn't work. The ship was within sight of Miami Harbor, could see the lights of Miami Harbor, and the US Coast Guard was preventing the ship from getting any closer. Canada also refused to take them. It, the ship had to go back. They were running out of food and water. They had to go back to Europe. The people on board got very desperate. They didn't want to go back to Germany. Thank goodness, with the assistance of the relief agencies, Britain took in about a third. Belgium, France, and the Netherlands took in the rest. However, as we know, only those who reached Great Britain were safe because of the way the war was about to unfold. I want to focus on one particular Jewish-German family because it takes us back to Sobibor, rather directly, and where I was standing in that field. This is Selma Simon, and her oldest daughter, Edith, and youngest daughter, Ilza. That photo on the right is taken on the SS St. Louis. She's on board with her husband and her oldest and youngest daughters. The two middle daughters have already reached Great Britain, thanks to the Kinder Transport Rescue Program. They're safe. They're turned around, they have to go back. The Netherlands takes in 181 passengers from the SS St. Louis, of which 84 are going to die in the Holocaust, and unfortunately Selma and her family are among them, with the exception of Edith. As soon as they reached the Netherlands in 1939, in June, they managed to get their daughter to Great Britain as well, the oldest one, Edith. But by May of 1943, Ilsa, the youngest, Selma, the mom, and Carl, the husband, the dad. They're deported first to Westerbork transit camp in the Netherlands, and then by the 21st of May, three days later, after their initial uh, collection, they arrive at Zobibor, where they are immediately gassed and cremated on the, that date, May 21st, 1943, and that's her 49th birthday. I was standing in the field where somewhere she's still there with her husband and her daughter and she had been within sight of the lights of Miami Harbor in that spring of 1939 and there I was in the spring of 2014 connecting those dots slowly but surely and sadly. I would say to praise the Sobibor archaeological team, which includes people from Israel and Poland um, working together, that they have done immense things in the last few years thanks to new forensic technologies. Over 70,000 artifacts have been discovered to help identify some of the victims. Over 30,000 came from Holland. You can't actually go to where I stood anymore and make that unfortunate contact with standing in the bones, amongst the bones of a killing field. They have now covered, as you can see here on the right, using white stones from an earlier memorial that was there at the uh, crematoria fields. They've covered it over with like a lid of stone, which is what they've done at other death sites like Treblinka. 
These cartoons, these cartoons come from um, New York newspapers um, at this time. The one on the right, 1939, is directly responding to this crisis. We see with incidents like this a turning point. Activists, journalists, people are now recognizing that Lady Liberty needs to defend the rights of the dispossessed. In this car cartoon, Lady Liberty is turning away in shame as the editorial goes that's next to this cartoon from the New York Daily Mirror of 1939. And as you can see on the right, the SS St. Louis is forced to leave. This double speak then of welcoming but not letting in is something that starts to need to be corrected in public awareness, thanks to unfortunate moments like this uh, tale of the SS St. Louis. Today's European and American migrant crises need to be brought into play, do they not, in our minds? From 1998 to 2018, the US Border Patrol has recorded that 70,505 <laughs> deaths have been recorded of people trying to get in from mostly uh, Central American countries, from war zones and scenes of terrible poverty and violence. Why are we not more cognizant of these statistics? If we look at the deaths in the Mediterranean, the European migrant crisis, why are we not more cognizant, again, of similar information, this time from the UN Commission, that we have 34,000 deaths between 1994 and 2018. People coming in, 50% of them from Syria, fleeing civil war, 20% from Afghanistan, 10% from Iraq. We could do activist art, or at least appreciate it and engage it as a way to show that we are aware of these statistics. Chinese artist activist uh, uh, Weiwei is uh, aware of this, dedicates a lot of his time to this. 14,000 life vests from the Greek islands have been collected. We have here the um, memorial uh, in Montgomery, Alabama as well to record the lynchings in over 800 US counties that need to be properly recorded in those counties. So it's a start. This is a, a very important new memorial. And turning back to the Statue of Liberty's poem, to the mother of exiles, to conclude my talk for you today, I think we need to remember that the Statue of Liberty her beacon is an aspirational model to which we can all aspire, to which we can all work. I think we need to help ask ourselves what we are doing to protect and maintain and recognize the humanity and dignity of those who are at their lowest point, the dispossessed and the tempest tossed. And I ask you to join me in reflecting how we can do more to safeguard what our democracy should surely be standing for. Thank you.